Hello, and welcome back to On the Record, presented by Shore in association with rope dope My name is Lewis Marks. I'm here at the rope dope Room in East Philadelphia. Welcome. If you're not familiar with the show, I'll tell you what it's about. Each week, guitarist Deck L. Bohr sits down with some of the finest producers, mixers, and engineers on the planet in a casual conversation and gets in deep about their setup, their techniques, their methods, their philosophy. This week, we have the wonderful pleasure of welcoming producer, mixer, and musician Stephen Lipson. He's worked with Grace Jones, Annie Lennox, Paul McCartney, Jeff Beck, Natalie Imbruglia, Hans Zimmer, and many more. Uh, if you go to his website, uh, you will find it's a bit cryptic. There's a simple bio and then a credits page that is listed alphabetically. Uh, prepare to scroll down a bit. His Facebook page reads like a movie magazine with the many films that he's worked on from Mission Impossible Fallout to the Lego Batman movie. He's got a plethora of Grammy nominations and quite a bit of hardware. I'm going to ask about that today. If you're not familiar with Deck El Bohr, here's the scoop. He's performed with jazz legends Johnny Griffin, Reggie Workman, Pat Martina, Billy Hart, and many more. His recent release, Let Love Rule, was out this year and is available at Deck El, sorry, Deck El Bohr.bandcamp.com. Deck El is responding to the current state of the world with these programs with fierce intent to connect people and to share some personal stories. In addition to this program, he runs a weekly program interviewing jazz artists called Speak In My Peace. That's running on Jazz Times and Rope It Up every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So without further ado, let's check in on Deck El Bohr and Stephen Lipson. All right, Louis, great to be back. Um, shooting from Berlin, I have the most incredible chance to speak to some of my heroes. Uh, the jazz world, we have a really long tradition of mentorship, which usually happens either backstage or in rehearsal rooms or before the gig, after the gig. It's our way of learning. It's our way of passing knowledge. Um, and now that this album that just came out, it's doing incredibly well. Um, Consider, considered for Grammy in four categories. And I'm working on the next one. And I have a lot of questions. How can I do this better? How can I do that better? Uh, especially how can I make things sound great? So I figured I'd reach out to some of my heroes, my mentors, um, or people that always admire their work and, you know, pick their brains for brilliance. So tonight, um, he needs no introduction. Uh, the one and one only Stephen Lipson. Stephen, how are you? Great. I'm good. Thank you. It's so wonderful to have you. Have you guys been dealing this past uh, six months, eight months, whatever it's been? You, you mean, well? how am I getting on with lockdown? Everybody's safe. Everybody's healthy. Yeah, i got to be honest. I love it. <laughs> I, I feel terrible saying it. And, and I know a lot of people are hit really hard, but... Um, I, I'm not the most sociable of creatures and I have an amazing, I built an extraordinary room at home and I've, I, I have a proper studio, which is brilliant, but I get out of bed and I walk up to the top of the house and um, work up here and I've mixed, I don't know, I, I've done loads up here, half a dozen major movies. I feel the same way. I feel like, you know, I have the guitar right over there. I've been locked downing, you know, since as long as, long as I can remember. I mean, yeah, I'm a musician. It's, pretty, that, it's that simple. You want to get good, you get in a room. Yeah. So I want to ask for a few things, but mainly you started playing guitar, right? Like where did music start for you? Yeah. At the age of eight, I started playing guitar. I never really got much better than that. But um, so from eight, I, I've always played guitar. I have too many guitars, ah. uh, you know, over the years. Oh, that's, I need one of those. You know, it's that thing. I don't have it in red. I only have it in blue. So <laughs> exactly. That sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> and even, actually, even worse, I had a, I moved studios years ago and had a whole bunch stolen. 
So I got the insurance money and replaced, it took me ages, but I replaced, I think, four guitars. And incredibly, all four turned up, either via the police or eBay or whatever. And so I've ended up with sort of four duplicates. And then I'm going, well, which one am I going to get rid of? Oh, I'll keep them, you know. So so, when we're talking duplicates, we're talking about a, a Strat? Uh, I can tell you what they are. It was a Strat, uh, the the one that was Stones over there. The other ones at the other studio, a Les Paul, a Which, wall what bass. What kind of Les Paul? Uh, it was a Black Beauty. Sixty nine. Uh, oh, you know what? I have no idea. And furthermore, sorry on that. I hate old guitars. <laughs> I kind of hate them because I'll, I'll take them. You know, buy them. You can't take them. I have two that are very old, a uh, three, and they're old, so I don't use them. You know, I like guitars. If they fall over, it doesn't matter. Mm. And anyway, uh, oh, it's a whole discussion. So, yeah. so uh, yeah. So I, I started playing guitar, and then I was in a band, and then, you know drugs, whatever, blew a record deal because it wasn't good enough when, in fact, it was amazing. And amazing then... Enough. Wait, 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 wait. Let's, 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 let's step back for a second. So you're playing guitar and you're learning Beatles songs? What kind of music? No, no, no. Blues? We wrote. There were three of us. And it was... Uh, my God, what year would it have been? So I'd have been 17... Uh, before then, you were eight. What started the bug? I mean, you listened oh, to music. Oh, I was friends. on holiday, and my dad bought me an acoustic guitar. Ah, it was that simple. And my cousin thought, oh, oh, my brother played drums. He was five years older than me, and of course, he was. You know, I looked up to my brother, who was in a group, and then so my cousin got a drum kit, and the two of us played. You know, in the bedroom, me on acoustic guitar, and him playing drums. So I was completely inaudible. And, um, Is you know, the usual stuff, moany, moany, you really got me, just nonsense, really. And um, and then uh, the first electric guitar, and then by, by devious means, I got hold of a Revox tape recorder, and then a drum box, and three, me and two pals, we, we formed this group, but it was a bedroom group, you know, headphones, drum box, and the other guy, one of the other guys had a tape machine that was, we used as an echo. It was chaos, really. But, but we wrote endlessly. And it was goodbye to a social life, which is when my lockdown started, about the age of 16. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so from, uh, and then at about the age of 18, we were offered a record deal. No, we must have been old and it, whatever. It doesn't matter. Young. Offered a record deal. And uh, stupidly, we decided it wasn't good enough, even though in retrospect, it was the most extraordinary record deal. And um, so we turned that down. And then... You're I, 20 at this point? You're 20? Yeah, about 20. Uh, and it was, we, we were, dare I say it, very good. For, you know, bedroom demos. I could play you some and you would be, be mind blown at how good they are. Uh, but at any rate, uh, so then uh, I, I used to do um, sessions for a friend who did jingles. Do you know what a jingle is? Of course, Ads. Yeah. yeah. And, and one day I said to him the most stupid thing. I said, uh, you know, it really annoys me. These engineer types they I never sound the guitar never sounds good. I wish I knew how to engineer because I could get the guitar sounding good. And um, so he said, "Well, it's funny you should say that." Hang on, uh, because I've just bought a property, and uh, I want to build a studio. Do you want to go fifty fifty with me? So at this point, I was twenty two, maybe. And uh, of course, it took me 0.001 of a nanosecond to say yes. And he gave me a really small budget and one year to complete building a studio from the ground up. There was just a big space, about 1,100 square feet. And this is in London? Yeah, in London. And, and you're um, 22 and you already own a studio. Well, no, I, did, I didn't own it. I was a shareholder. I, does that mean I, I kind of yeah, owned it? But, it but it was worthless because the, the, I didn't know what I was doing. Literally nothing. I knew, I, I knew 
That's yeah, more than most engineers I know. Yeah, I mean, what? Knowing nothing? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. That's a bit damning. Um, so I had to learn what gear to buy, acoustics, how to design a studio. Anyway, I did it, and then the first session. Then within eight weeks, we were happening. You know, the studio was booked. A band came in, and uh, the producer just read books, and I, I did kept telling him what to do and got a producer credit and the record went to number eight in the American charts. It was the <laughs> weirdest thing. And I thought, oh, this is easy, you know, and that was it. You know, no more hits until whenever for another eight years. But the, so we had a, we, we had a, a subject here. So the generation before you was the, the kind of producer that basically booked the gig, booked the session got maybe some of the extra band members. And yeah. That's basically what the producer was. You mean they were a facilitator? Yeah. And you yeah. So what, No, I so... was a player. So it was a bit unusual because I, I learned to engineer, not because I wanted to engineer, but just because of circumstances. So I could engineer, I could play, I could write. So... But I was ahead of my time because that's what happens now. But then people didn't really do that. You know, the producer would sit at the back of the room a little bit, smoking a cigar, going, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. sing yeah. it again. So so I was slightly out of step until uh, in, in 83. It was 83, which means I was 20... Nine or whatever, something like that. Um, I went to work with Trevor Horn, and uh, unwillingly, I have to say, because I had this idea of being a producer, and and you know, what did I want to work with him? Anyway, I didn't like his records, you know, M huge jealousy, and because uh, I he was a session player and he used to come to the studio and I knew him, and then he had these hits and I I was seething, you know. Anyway, so I got, they said, would I engineer for him for two days? And the money was good. So I thought, you know what, two days, I'll go and do it. And I stayed there for eight years. And um, it, it was the irony of it was what he liked about me was that I just did whatever I wanted to do. I played if I wanted to play. I told the singer what to, you know, I I sort of <laughs> did whatever I want. And he loved it because he's great at, at getting people who are good and go, go, you know, do it. So so it was weird for me so, at the start. So at what point did shift the things shift from being the guy that booked the session to being someone like you who has an artistic vision? I mean, what was I don't know. I don't know. You're now you're asking me something about about the history of record production, and I, I couldn't really tell you. I do know that um, about the that in the eighties uh, there were producers like Hugh Padgham, who yeah. I knew well, the loveliest man. He was basically a really good engineer. So, and then Glyn Johns, who was my you know I. I idolized Glyn Johns. He was in the 70s, wasn't he? And he yeah. was really an engineer who had ideas. But it, they, so the, I suppose mid-70s onwards, engineers shifted over to production. I don't really know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just making it up. But and, it, that's what it feels like. And this was, a, this was at a point where you were still taking gigs, I mean... 70s early 80s right you, i was you, a freelance engineer yeah i had to be and to earn money your your taste ranged from do you have any preferences to which artists take which albums to make or yeah the ones that book me i <laughs> always like the ones who book me yeah so at what what happened i mean when i when i there was a tipping point that right after when i heard your work you couldn't open the radio or MTV or without hearing a Stephen Lipson song. I mean, well, what there, are... there, there were two, oh, I don't know, two moments, really. With, with, when I was with Trevor, uh, we had a good run. 
which was, of course, Frankie's and then Propaganda. And then I, I, I'll forget loads. We did Grace Jones and then Pet Shop Boys and Paul McCartney, I think. More, but that will do. And then I left. And I left because I thought I've, I have to be an entity. You know, I can't live in in Trevor's shadow, e even though he, they, he, Trevor and his late wife, Jill, were really good to me, you know. Uh, I, I think I did a Simple Minds album. We co-produced a Simple Minds album. That might have been the last thing, or McCartney, I can't remember. Anyway, and I left. And uh, then Annie Lennox. That, I did way, that was... The, to just throw it out, how did that game gig came about? I mean, uh, that was uh, the biggest gig on the planet at that point. Yeah, well, that came about because... Um, uh, let me think. I was very friendly with a guy called Simon Fuller. Right? Now, Simon Fuller, before I'd had uh, connected with Trevor, he'd asked me to produce a... Was it that? It doesn't matter. It might have been around the same time. A band for him called The Adventures. And uh, so I did this song. It was a cover of Monday Monday by um, the Mums and the Puppers. Mm. Right? And I did this. And, and then we lost touch. But I really... He was the loveliest guy. And uh, we lost touch. And I was doing, I think, the second Simple Minds album on my own. That's right. And I was in Scotland. And, of course, producing Simple Minds at the time was like they were one of the biggest bands in the yeah. world. Yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm the boy. Not really. But, you know, it's like a great it thing. It very exciting, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was exciting. And then he called and he said... Uh, some, some, uh, someone picked the phone up and said it's uh, Simon Fuller on the phone. No one knew who Simon Fuller was at the time. And, um, and it's Simon Fuller. You know what? I, I, I haven't got... To, I'll, look, I'll, yeah, I'll talk to him. Hello? You know, like, I've got 10 seconds. What do you want? And he goes, he goes, you won't believe this, but I've just started managing Annie Lennox and I want you to produce her album. Can you come and meet her? And I was like, I, shell shocked because she. This I, was right after Eurythmics, right? Yeah, yeah. She just left I Eurythmics. Mean, she's like the. It's like the biggest pop star on the planet. Yeah, and the irony was, I'd said to Jill Sinclair, who was sort of my manager, uh, before um, before I left. She said, "Who would you like to work with?" <laughs> and and I said to going. her. I said to her, I'd like to work with that singer in Eurythmics. Not the uh, not the guy, her. And she went, oh, yeah, OK, fat chance, you know. Anyway, so Simon says, come down to London, because I was working in Scotland, and uh, meet her this weekend. So I said to the guys, Jim and Charlie, look, I I've just got to go home this weekend. And in the meantime, I called my new manager, a guy called Ralph Simon, most delightful man. I don't know if you know Ralph. He, he yeah. used to be a partner in Zomba. Mm. Uh, anyway, um, because when I left ZTT and Jill and Trevor, I needed some management. He, and, and I said, Ralph, you won't believe this. Uh, Simon Fuller, who? Simon Fuller, don't worry. He's he's managing Annie Lennox and he's asked me to produce her album and I'm coming down to meet her. And he's going, you know, that's a poison chalice because the only way is down. And I'm going, I'm going, fuck that, I'm that's in. A, that's a problem I could have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was a, he was, he was right, but I thought, I love her voice. I just want to work with her. I, I, listen, it's, who, who am I to know? But it could be right. It could also just going to go. Many people left uh, like a big pop act and the record didn't really happen. I mean, it, oh, you know, it happens. But yeah. with what you guys to get, did together, it was a uh, well, series. Well, it, it, but it was it, Diva the, and it was Medusa. I mean, it, it was it, like. Yeah. But the thing is, there might be um, reasons for that. There, there, in fact, there are reasons for that. Firstly, uh, when she played me the demos, 
for so her when album. She, when she's playing you demos, it's her and guitar? No, it's her and a guy called Marius de Vries. She'd done the demos with Marius. If you so, don't know who he is, look him up. He's amazing. I will, I will. Marius, D-E-V-R-I. What? He played on the album, right? Probably he would have because I'd have kept loads of his demos. And it was her, like, what's, what's the instrumentation? What was what? More or less. What, what is the instrumentation? Because what you what, guys The demos? Great. Yeah. Oh, I can't remember. They, were, they weren't finished. They were demos, but with good ideas. Anyway, uh, I listened to them, and um, I said, I remember, I said, yeah, they're good. <laughs> I, you know, I was a bit shell-shocked meeting her, because she, she's quite, she's, I, I love her. She, but she's very intense, not but. I love her full stop. She's very intense, Annie. And, and uh, I, 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 I didn't feel I could be jumping up and down around the room. I, I felt quite reserved. Anyway, so I went home and Simon called me and said, she doesn't want to work with you. And I said, why? He goes, because you didn't seem to like the demos. And I said to him, I love the demos. I just didn't know how to respond. <clears throat> oh, well, you better call her. So I called her. Anyway, and then we got together and she wanted to make the album in her house in London. That's, that's and so a, we set up a studio. That's a British top, tradition, right? I don't know, maybe. From Zeppelin to Stones to Annie Lennox. Yeah, I mean, well, you, it's, you know what? It's a nice way to do it. You, we set up an amazing room at the top of her house. And um, I had the best but, team. But times were really different. I mean, to set up a room in someone's house back then would have cost a fortune. Well... No, yes and no. We used two Sony 24-track digital machines. And uh, I can't remember what the console was, whatever. Small, like soundtracks or whatever, something. And a small pair of Dynaudio speakers, a little bit of outboard gear, and we were dumb. And um, a lot of cables, because the machines had to be the floor below. And, and so it was my... The guy who was I was working with, Hef Moraes, who was my engineer, um, and Peter Vitesi, who's a key most he's like a prodigy keyboard player, mm. and Annie. And that was it. That was the team. And we spent months. We finally had to leave because the neighbor started complaining. Spending months doing what? Writing, adjusting. She had half free. the album and yeah trying to figure what the album should be and i kept saying look the guitarist has left it's you know it was just, I i'm available saying, the guitarist has left there should be no guitar on this album this is my thing let's make it a keyboard album you play the keyboards your guitarist is gone let's not have let's think no guitar so that was the sort of idea it's a pretty thin idea, but um, that, that was as good as the concept got. Then some songs were really quick. Some took, I, I can't tell you how long. There were, there were two songs in particular took weeks and weeks. One was a song called Money Can't Buy It, which uh, basically was never written. It never felt like it, it was written. It was like a great couple of lines and a load of fluff, and we somehow turned it into this thing that was good, but it never felt like a, a song. It felt like a thing. And the other one was why. And the problem why we had... A long, a long time? Oh, forever. Because I, I couldn't figure the rhythm. I couldn't get the rhythm. It was the demo, Maris's demo, had um, just the opening piano was the... Was it piano, whatever it was? Do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah, that, right. right? And fours, a four click. And that was it. And it was so boring. And, and uh, so we needed to figure how to get a rhythm, which took, I can't tell you how long it took. We ended up getting the guy from Japan. I don't know why it was Steve Jansen. I think because he, I kept saying, there's this guy in Japan, he's really weird. Why don't we get him? 
I didn't know anything about him, but we got him down. He did this programming, and it was really complicated, brush stuff and noises, and he delivered it to us. I think it was in an Akai, the Akai sampler. Yeah. And uh, we just kept a few elements, this brush thing, which I still have the loop of. It, it almost sounds like a jazz track. That yeah, well, the it's intro. the brushes yeah. that he did. And then there was another... That 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 was a breakthrough moment. And the other thing was, sorry, I'll just tell you this other thing, was um, sitting about very frustrated. And I said to Peter, why don't you play a, a, an eight guitar part over the track? Because it's so lumpy and laborious. Why don't you just play something in eights? And he went, he, Peter, he goes, all right, all right, just play the track. And he played this part and it became the main part. It was like one take. He did it with this guitar sound in a Roland synth. And it's a sort of rolling eights part that goes all the way through. And we cracked the song. So it just took ages, though. And also, she didn't have all the songs when that, we started. That song was, I remember being a kid going to parties and it was an anthem. You couldn't open MTV without that, that beautiful clip for it. Could open the radio, uh, and there were, and then it seemed like you guys were like on a roll. Every every song, on, every song on the album would become like a like a huge cultural thing. Just the most incredible videos. <clears throat> oh, she did all the videos with uh, Sophie Muller in Venice. It was amazing. They went. I can't remember if it was a weekend or a week. The two of them with a case full of <laughs> odd clothes. And they went to Venice and just made it up. We, there we were the videos. We just got back from Venice, just before it's, we're going into lockdown in Berlin. And it kind of makes sense. I can see the connection. Yeah. So speaking of it, you said it was like a one-take guitar part. Is Annie, is, is Annie a one-take kind of vocalist? Or is, this a, or is it a process? What is it like to get to that golden thing on the album? You know what, talking about how people sing is f a funny thing because I, I always feel um, it's quite kind of private. How I the, how, agree. You, you know? Of course. So it's sort of. She'll, she'll I, I can't tell you the details, but basically Understood. Understood. she'll sing. And then she'll stop and go, no, just drop me in back there and on, and she'll keep doing it. And then, and then we'll have all that, right? And then I'll say, just why don't you just run through it? Now you've got yourself an idea, just run through it a few times, and then it's comped. But it's never that simple, of course. There's a lot more to it. Having said that, I do feel the key to getting good vocals is, not, is like nil pressure. You know, not now we're going to do the vocals. Just, oh, go out and sing. Yeah. You know. So, but anyway, she's she's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so you said that was one. What was the next big moment where things were, like, moving somewhere? Things that are different all of a sudden. I'm assuming that that brought an endless work for you, those two albums or three albums. I <sighs> I, do you know what? I don't know because I, I'm, I was only doing one thing at a time. So I, all I know is I've worked pretty consistently most of my career, you know, with the odd spots where I haven't got much on. But generally I'm working and I don't know if it's due to something. I don't never know why. But um, funnily enough, the next uh, moment that sticks in my mind was when... Uh, this is going to sound terrible. Uh, I, when I knocked myself off number one with a number one record, so it was. But neither record, I, I wasn't that uh, sort of enamoured with either record, which is the funny thing about it. Which, uh, one, which records are we talking about? I, do you know, I can't remember. I think it was Don't Stop Moving, which is S Club 7, uh, who the record, I loved making the S Club 7 records, I have to say. Uh, and I think it knocked off, um, it might have been uh, Jerry Halliwell, It's Raining Men. 
maybe I can't remember or or Ronan Keating no I, I I do you know what? I can't remember but I do know that I ended up with number one and number two and it was just a funny thing it did it kind of meant something you know all this stuff kind of means something I'm not not quite sure what but it was a moment at any rate uh, and the next you know big moment would probably have been um Jeff Beck maybe ah, that's, a cool, that's an amazing album anything you yeah. can tell me about that album I'm in I mean that's well, a landmark album if I'm a guitarist I'm a hardcore guitarist let me practice all day let me gig all night and the Jeff Beck albums for me are yours and blow by blow I mean that's yeah. like the those are the statements I had this thing with it was a constant thing with Jeff he said I'm not shredding enough and and <laughs> I, I'm his biggest fan. I've got to tell you, it, there are guitar players, and then there's Jeff Beck. He's yes. in, on a different level to everyone. What, what makes him on a different level to you? Like, what what is it to you? I don't know. He's like a singer. Obviously, he's a brilliant player, but what he plays is, and the way there's a song on that album where the melody is unbelievably simple. And I'm a guitar Nessun, player. Nessun Dorma? What are we talking about? No, no. I'll tell you what it is. Uh, hang on. I've just got to find it. Uh, because, because for I've... me, for a guitarist to do, for a rock guitarist to do Nessun Dorma, it takes... And it's in a, I had another question about the album. The, the, the string arrangements are yours. No, Pete Murray, uh, a friend of mine who I get always use, well, not always, but as much as possible. He's amazing, Pete Murray. Great, great keyboard player, brilliant arranger. Uh, let me just find this song and I'll, I'll t tell you. Um, is this actually. We're, we're running a risk of, of Facebook algorithms throwing, it off, throwing us off the air. Okay, hang on. Anything that's copyrighted that could lead us into. A well, it's either a song called Serene or Never Alone. It doesn't matter. It's both of those, actually. The melodies are incredibly simple, right? They're, they're, they're like a child melody. And the way he plays them, if I play them, they sound, I, I sound like an idiot. When he plays them, they sound like, I can't explain, they, they just emote like crazy. They're just brilliant when he plays them. And I think that's what I love about him. So when I uh, pro I proposed that we made an album uh, of songs where he was the singer, and he kind of went for the idea, he bottled out a couple of times, understandably, and we ended up with a few sung songs. Yeah. But to a large extent, he's the singer, lead singer on the album. Definitely. Yeah. And and uh, there there were. Um, he play God being in the room when he plays is something else. You know, I'm here and he's just behind me, and he'd do something that took my breath away, and he'd go, oh, "Well, how was that then?" I go, "How was that?" My God, you know, if I could do a millionth of that, I would, I would, would be the happiest man on the planet. It was great, Jeff. Ah, let me do another one, you know. <laughs> and so I comp. All, all his this brilliant stuff and everything he played sounded different. You know, he'd be flicking the pickup switch and changing the amp and the pedals, and the, so it was like comping ten voices into one lead vocal track. Fascinating. I mean, what do you do? You accentuate the difference, of course. But yeah. but the reason I mention it is because. The, some of the solos, I left huge spaces. And I remember the first time he heard them. Wait, 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 wait. You left, meaning these are edited solos or it's... Yeah, he played like a maniac and then would go home. And I just, I, I was like, you know, it was like a kid in a candy store. Okay. Go, oh, this is amazing. You know, and I'd just pick all my favourite bits and put them all and listen and go, well, I'll do this and that and that. Of course, if I played the original of what he did, they'd all be amazing. But I had this idea of pacing it like a, not, not, not classical, but this, this way of crescendoing the solo rather than coming in like a, like full on, which he does on one song called Hammerhead. 
Yeah. You know, the solo's full on. But every other solo, it's very d- d- sort of delicately placed. I love that. I love the idea of the greatest guitar player in the world. You know, just playing a note if you, you know uh peter green do you like of peter course, green i love peter green so of there's course. a song called i need your love so bad yeah 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 and what's so great about it is not what he plays what he doesn't play yeah you know yeah he, he had a knack for that he oh really yeah had a knack for that. he'd play and, a phrase and then just wait and the most beautiful sound in the world yeah that that, no, that never hurts yeah so if we're speaking about sound, and what are your tips to getting great guitar sound in a studio? Get on with it. <laughs> All Don't right, waste time. That. You know, if I've learned anything, it's there is no... What's, what's the right sound? What does that mean? You know, it's, it's weird. I, I pick what guitar I'm going to play not I, this sounds really pathetic but not because of the sound it makes but what it looks like because what it looks like makes me feel yeah different yeah i don't really care about the sound i, I mean that's pretty a blanket remark i mean distorted clean you know but oh, I'll after be the that first to tell you that i started playing guitar because they because they look so damn cool they look yeah. incredible. I mean, yeah. anyone that looks decent looks better with a guitar on it. It's that simple. Yeah. Oh, my guitars are outside. My, they all look great, my guitars. I look <laughs> at them every day. I love them. But, you know, all, like Jeff, he... he uh, we had to work in my room. It was just a big room. And so we needed a very small amp because it was in the room. And he said he had a load of amps that are all huge. You know, and he said, so which, um, what amps have you got? And I pointed, I showed him all my amps. I had a little Fender Pro Junior, I think it's called. It's like that big. Yeah, yeah. The, the and he goes, oh, that'll do. That'll do. Stuck it in the corner. That was it. That was the, the amp we used. It what I'm saying good. is it kind of does whatever. It, it sort of doesn't matter. Just make your statement, you know. Um, it was beautiful to hear him with the orchestra. I mean, yeah. those for me are the moments of the album and the yeah. mo- some of the moments of his career. Yeah. Um, so I have another question. You, your career uh, transferred from the times where records made a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. Yeah. To where it is now where someone there's no way to recoup on anything you're getting a zilch of a zilch for a stream yeah what is what's what's your take on this i mean having having worked through the, the transition it's it's difficult because i only did two things for money in my life quite honestly there are two projects i've done for money that's it. Everything else I've done because I wanted to do the, the work. The work interested me. So it's a hard... And, and of course, you're right. I, I worked during the golden age when records sold. So I'm in a privileged position of... I, I wasn't stupid. I don't live a flamboyant life. So I'm fine. I, I live a small life. And I'm okay. I don't need to work for the money. But having said that, I can tell you that if I am... I can't really tell you, can I? Someone will kill me. <laughs> but, but it's pointless. Now, if I want to make an album with someone, uh, what I'm going to make, it, it, it's irrelevant to me just about i i don't know what so i i don't know what to say it's not going to make any most, difference to that's me. that's the most beautiful thing you would ever say to me about this i mean it this is just pure golden so i'm really i'm i'm 
reaching the end of where we're going. So I have a couple of things. There were a couple of audience questions. The first yeah. one was, what is the difference to work with someone like McCartney as opposed to someone like Billy Eilish? Just the different generations and the different... Uh... It's not the artists that's different. I think it's the times that are, di are different. In what way? Uh, <clears throat> well, because... Uh... The way we work now is very different. You know, this whole, uh, and and this is pre-lockdown, but but a lot of uh, what I did with Billie Eilish was kind of remote, you know. So, and they, they Phineas is really good and did, you know, the track. That, that record, that record, boy, what uh, that was an amazing, amazing experience making that record. You, you're you're talking about no time to die, yeah. Um, I was so so many ways. It's too complicated to go into, but it was a it was a three month exercise to get that across the line, and um, uh, it, it it's incomparable to working with McCartney because with McCartney you're all in the room. You know, and he's going. I've got an idea. What do you think? You know, and it, the, <laughs> that the is, that's what he's like in the studio. He's an improviser. Oh, my God, he is extraordinary. He would be the best. He's the best person to have in a band ever. Just the vibe, the energy. Yeah, ideas. Great player. What a singer. He can write the odd song. I mean, what's what's not to like? You know, he's a really good drummer. He's a great bass player superb guitar player keyboards no problem saxes <laughs> whatever you want he's up for it and he's got ideas constantly but isn't it mostly with someone like him about he's the beetle i mean there's this huge persona that does all those things there's use this charisma this weight this he, he lifts the his vocals I don't know if he's a great vocalist, but he will lift the room. He's Isn't a, he, it about well, that? When, when we work with him, uh, he, impre he impressed me in every way. Every way. Uh, I, I can't speak highly enough about, about his... his uh, I, I want to say, I don't mean talent. His, obviously talent, but in a way, it's a funny word to say, but his usefulness, you know, he was, he was amazing to have around. We, what, the first song we did was called Rough Ride. Mm. And we did it because um, I'd bought this rig, you know, load of synths and drum boxes and computers and, and I'd set them up in his studio and, and Trevor, while I was setting up, listened through the songs that Paul had and he picked one that matched a rhythm that I'd knocked up on my new rhythm box. I had this Yamaha rhythm box and I'd done a rhythm and he said, um, he said, well, I picked this song because you, you, you know that rhythm you've got. Yeah, I know that rhythm. Well, that, that'll work with this song. Oh, okay. So I've got my rig and I hit play on the, thing and Macca goes oh I like that good he picks up a guitar and so he's playing guitar Trevor's playing the keyboards and I thought fuck this I'll play the bass right ah. so I had a keyboard and I got this bass sound that I've been nurturing and we just kept running through the song and and every now and then I would have a panic attack because I'm playing the bass and Wisdom right over there is Paul McCartney. Yeah. You know, it just felt terribly wrong. But he, he was great. He was going, yeah, yeah, great. Come on, let's, you know, it was all, it was like this, the whole thing. Really good, good Unbelievable. fun. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, second to last question. And this is a, it's a kind of technical. On, on, you did a lot of uh, essential of greatest hits of uh especially the work with Whitney Houston there's one one song you wrote no I only, only did one song with her that ah. funny it was called step by step yeah yeah 
but working on a greatest hits or the singles on what does that entail as a producer? I'll tell you what, uh, I've worked on the greatest, I did a single for a group called Prefab Sprout, who had a greatest hits. They were uh, they're a, a most extraordinary group. And I was asked to produce a single to go on their greatest hits. Uh, it was called The Sound of Crying. Um, it, whatever, you do what you do. You make it as good as you can and hope for the best. What else can you do? You're 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 asking whether it, the, what the pressure, what I'm I'm asking whether it's is it about remixing the song? Is it choosing the song order? Is it coming up with a new track? Is it? Oh, I see what you mean. No, that in I, I've never. You mean make compiling a best yeah. of album? I've yeah. never done that. Ah, oh. no, I'm, I'm mistaken. My mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the Whitney Houston one was, I think, either The Bodyguard or another movie. It was just a song for a movie. Mm. And uh, what was the Rolling Stones experience like? Extraordinary. It was three months in Paris. Wow. Uh, where, uh, uh, oh, it, it's a chapter. It's a, uh, what can I tell you? I, it would take from now until the morning for me to tell you what the experience was like. But suffice it to say, um, it was very strange, like the strangest experience I've ever had in my life. In, in what way? How so? Well, Mick and Keith weren't getting on at all. <laughs> it was their, their major low point. Drugs, a go-go, and Keith's father appeared, and they hadn't seen each other for 20 years, and he just sat in the studio looking at this circus his son was living. Uh, it, the whole thing was like a, it was like a, a Fellini movie. I, I can't, it was just weird. And we started at midnight and went through to eight, and nobody was cooperating with anyone and they were paying me less than it cost me to live in the hotel they insisted <laughs> I stay in. So I was funding my stay. Uh, I mean, the whole thing was, like, weird. But that's a hell of an story, experience. What? That's the story of any, of any of their albums. All of those classic albums, it's always like this epic love affair of a project that never ends. Maybe, maybe. I, I was thinking about this the other day, and, and to be perfectly honest, my, my favourite Stones records are the, the, you know, the original singles that were mm. like pop songs. Can't Get No Satisfaction, yeah. Let's Spend the Night Together. Yeah, classics. Yeah, fabulous. And then they got into this other thing. Which is that the sort Bohemian. of loose, yeah, the vibey thing. Well, whatever. It wasn't really my thing quite so much. Beautiful. Whatever. So, last question. Anything that, um, any records you've been listening to that inspired you in this past six months that we have time to kind of time on our hands that maybe people would find interesting? I, do you know what? I'm not sure because uh, I use Shazam. You know what Shazam is? Yeah, yeah, of course. All the time. And um, why won't that move? Uh, and, uh, ah, there we go. And so I'm, I'm never really sure what I'm listening to. I'm kind of... Uh, let me have a look. I like that new Taylor Swift record. Mm. I, think, I think that's... The certainly. One. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Uh, what else have I got here? Uh, hang on. Uh, that's funny. No, and then it's all over the place, actually. I, I can't really tell you, because if I look down, I'm looking in my library now, and it's just one song here, one song there, you know. Yeah. It's you, Stephen, you told me on this conversation, and uh, you told me enough for a lifetime. I, mean, I can't yeah, thank yeah. you enough for coming. Oh, a pleasure.
Uh, I'm just looking to see if there's anything that's appealing at the moment. No, no nothing in particular and everything any in jazz? general. Any jazz that you've been checking out? No, but I've got a soft spot for smooth jazz. Ah. I've got to be honest. You're I kind of, you know, whatever. Uh, but I like all sorts of music, the weirdest stuff. Like really weird. Give me an example. Okay, I'll give you an example. I like... Uh, all right. I'll just read a bunch of things here. Please do. Keston Wright, mm. Jamie Woon, Sebastian Teller. Uh, uh, I don't know any of those names. It's all, they're all over the place. This is what I'm telling you. It's because I Shazam, Ingrid Michaelson, I love her. I need to learn a lot. Do you not know Ingrid Michaelson? None of these people. I oh, she's Mouse good. Sean Colvin. Day. She's ah, great, Sean Colvin. Colvin. Yeah, hang on. Uh, well, Francoise Hardy, why not? Uh, Joan is a policewoman. I love her. Loads, and, and it's all Frank Sinatra, uh -huh. Liquid Monk, Moonchild. I love Moonchild. <laughs> Charlie Puth's interesting. Post Malone's pretty good. Marina oh, nice. Palo is to die for. Dua Lipa's good. I like Paloma Faith. I'll tell you who's a great singer. Jessie J. Mm. Do you know her? Yeah, of course. Anyway, she won some competition, I think, in China. Uh, what am I looking at? Cheryl Crow. I like Cheryl Crow. Gorillas. Uh, this is more just, incredibly varied. Beautiful. Yeah, varied. whatever. Steely Dan. Uh, what's this? Justin Timberlake. Oh, it's that song. I love that song, Can't Stop the Feeling. You know, it's from some film. Yeah, what films are from? That are great. Yeah. I like uh, Christina and the Queens. Uh, Think. Love Think. Mark Ronson, that Uptown Funk record. Brilliant record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that should be a course at, at music college. This well, this semester, we're studying uptown funk. You know, you could basically make a whole thing, couldn't you? He's he's brilliant. The, he's he's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, he's great. Uh, I could go on and on. Uh, we'll we'll do it next time. Next yeah, time we'll whatever. discover favorite music. <laughs> Stephen, thanks so much for coming. It's been a pleasure. such an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I learned so much. It's been a beautiful ride. Uh, stay safe. Um, I'll keep in touch. Great. And good again, to talk thank to you. you. For coming. Ah, it was my pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, whoever is watching, thanks so much to Stephen Lipson for his beautiful work and for his contribution to modern culture, really. Uh, next week, we have Daryl Thorpe, who has worked with Radiohead and Elton John and many, many, many more. And we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Stay safe and stay well, and we'll be in touch. <laughs>